Welcome hunts. Conflict can be as fearsome as stepping up to deadly violence with mortal resistance or as subtle as a new and emerging consciousness. Today, I will briefly argue that conflict is integral to the development of human society and specifically has been integral to the history and continuing development of Unitarian Universalism. This study has led to a developing understanding of the questions which I have heard asked many times over the years. Why is Unitarian Universalism a religion? The lyrics of this song by Peter Mayer, which will be sung by Ev, perhaps will contribute to our understanding of how developing knowledge and conflict so often go hand in hand. Do you really want to know? By Peter Mayer, sung by Ev. The sun once went around the earth According to the Holy Church Which helped to reassure People that they were The center of the universe One day His Holiness the Pope Met a man with a telescope And said, hey Mr. Galilei What does your spyglass say? And the scientist spoke He said it's really quite amazing Entirely life-changing So let me ask before I show you Do you really want to know? Oh, do you really want to know? Emma read the Bible for direction She said she was a child of heaven And that the human race came from a higher place From the angels descended She wound up marrying her cousin He was a thinker of a husband She'd find him and she'd say Hey Charlie, what you writing? Darwin looked up and said It's really quite amazing Entirely life-changing So let me ask before I show you Do you really want to know? Oh, do you really want to know? Let freedom like a breeze in through The door of your belief run through the rooms and corridors Knock cherished heirlooms to the floor The wind can raise the roof sometimes And leave you blinking at the sky you stare into the glass beware that there's no going back you'll say sunrise but it will refuse instead the earth itself will move and spin you round from dawn to dawn and leave you stranded with it oh, 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 oh. oh, oh.
Thank you, Ev. Yes, we really do want to know in this congregation. <laughs> that was beautiful. Welcome, everyone, to this morning and to this chance to be together in community in a time of joy, comfort, insight, challenge, and hopefully growth, spiritually or otherwise. My name is Sue Forbes, and I'm Allison's assistant this morning. I and others come to this North Shore congregation to learn, among other things, about being in relationship, about how to listen, how to forgive, how to be vulnerable, and how to create trust and compassion in one another and within ourselves. Here we strive to express ourselves honestly and respectfully and to learn from a variety of wise sources, including each other. We're here to be inspired, to love widely, to live justly, and to be open to connection in all its forms. We hope all of you feel very welcome here today. And as we light our chalice to indicate that our time here is special, we acknowledge that we meet on the traditional lands of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam nations. We kindle this flame as a symbol of our gathering. May the light of understanding illuminate our darkness. May the warmth of sharing bring us peace. And now let us join our hearts and voices in singing Gather the Spirit. Please stand as you're able. started this journey of inquiry, having, like all of us, experienced conflict throughout my life, and in particular, having held a space in the midst of some conflict here in this community for the past few years. When I started to write my first draft for this sermon, I looked back at my earliest notes and was surprised to see that my first heading was how to avoid conflict, exclamation <laughs> mark. In the studying I've done since then, my viewpoint has radically changed. I no longer consider the avoidance of conflict as even desirable. I can see that conflict is an integral aspect of the human condition both as individuals on their own life path and as communities and societies. Having said that, there are many levels of conflict, and when conflict can be met with enhanced understanding on both sides before they become too rigid, too hurt, it makes for much easier and speedier resolution and growth. 
There are extraordinary tools for helping people navigate conflict in ways that can help communities lessen the damage. But that is a topic for another sermon. So, to the history of conflict within the development of the Unitarian Universalist religion. First, I would like to clarify that I am not talking about personal conflict within congregations, not about who likes who, who's in charge of what, who's stepping on someone else's toes. And I'm certainly intentionally avoiding the conflict that this congregation has experienced over the last few years. There will be opportunities to analyze and work through these issues, but this moment is not one of them. In preparing to write this talk, I read books on the history of Unitarian Universalism, and once I had a small inkling of the scope of this topic, well, I nearly gave up. <laughs> no, I got interested and fascinated by the history of this church that I have come to dearly love. The first paper I wrote was on historical events, historical people, places, and of course, dates. But I came to realize that by the end of 15 minutes, I would be observed by people who were sliding off their seats, attempting not to pass out from the sheer effort of trying to follow what I was saying. So I decided that rather than regale you with historical facts, I would make a timeline, which you see downstairs, it's attached to the library. If you're interested, it gives lots of people, dates, and facts. It looks a little bit like it was created in a kindergarten class, though. I apologize. <laughs> so today, I will summarize briefly the broad patterns of conflict which I observed from my reading. I'll briefly summarize each of these three categories of conflict patterns. The first is the conflict between an individual and the wider society. It emerges as the uneasy awareness on the part of a brave person who gradually comes to realize that the beliefs and dogmas which they live within and are inheriting either from their family or society feel wrong. They come to see that there is a truth which is not being spoken and they feel called to either leave the source of the falseness or speak their truth. The consequences of this have ranged from discomfort to ostracization to death. This insistence of seeking emerging truth has come to be articulated amongst the UU community as the principle of a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Over the centuries and throughout all societies, thousands of people have sacrificed their safety and sometimes their lives for this principle. An example from the history of Unitarian Universalism is Michael Servetus, a Spanish thinker, doctor and theologian. He was born in 1511. He came to believe that the teaching of the Trinity, among other doctrines, was an error. He believed the illogicality of this concept of the Trinity could keep people from wholeheartedly adopting the beliefs of the Church. And so he challenged Calvin publicly. While at first Calvin was tolerant of this young upstart, the dogged determination for public discourse on the part of Servetus eventually drove Calvin to demand that Servetus be brought to trial in Geneva. Talk about conflict. What must it have felt like for Michael Servetus to challenge the teachings of Calvin? While his particular issue with the Catholic Church was around Trinitarianism, which means God is three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, versus Unitarianism at that point, which considers God being only one person. Yes, for a long time, this was a hotly contested topic. But what he showed with his life was the belief in the right to query the teachings of the Church, the right to draw your own conclusions about your faith and the right to argue publicly issues of religion. This 
cost him his life. At the trial, he was predictably found guilty. He was burned at the stake in Geneva in October 27th in 1553. That might have been the end of the story, but such was the outcry at his manner of death and as others responded to it and forwarded the public discourse, he forever furthered the idea of religious tolerance. The second source of conflict is between one group and another within the organization. As an individual speaks out a new way of seeing truth, others will gather around him or her, excited to hear their as yet unformed ideas being given voice, being given credibility. People gather around the individual who's articulating this new vision. And when the ideas are theological in nature, they may declare themselves to be a church and celebrate their newfound voice, proclaiming the truth for all to hear. So they're a church. Years pass, life and business takes over, and those who once were the new voice of truth have become comfortable in their ideas. One day, a young upstart shows up and declares that the original group had now become the orthodox group, the conservative voice, and she now holds a new truth. A new liberal voice has emerged from within the congregation, causing unease and, no doubt, strife. But with courage, she and her followers will move the organization forward on the perilous march toward a broader vision for the future adapting old ideas and incorporating them into a new way. If the two ideas and their holders cannot make room for each other, they will split and create a new congregation. This is not necessarily bad. It is easier in many ways. But it avoids the opportunity of growth for enlarging one vision to hold both truths. Throughout history, this has occurred numerous times to both individual congregations and entire denominations. The Protestant Reformation with Luther evolved out of Catholicism. Luther actually only wanted to tweak a couple of things. It didn't work out that way. Calvinism, in turn, emerged from Lutheranism. Congregationalism and Unitarianism were in part created from a reaction to Calvin. A no doubt hurtful example of this was experienced by Balu, one of the early preachers of the universalist faith. He was preaching in the church of his mentor, John Murray, the first father of universalism in America. John Murray was away, presumably preaching on a Sunday morning. However, his wife, Judith Murray, a staunch ally of her husband, was in the congregation. Well, the young upstart Baloo's theology had evolved considerably from that of her husband. And so shocked was she to hear a doctrine so different from that preached by her husband that she quietly passed a note to the choir director to inform the congregation that the, con the doctrine heard from the pulpit today is not the doctrine generally heard from this pulpit choir director did as he was told. In response to this, Balu politely urged the congregation to attend to Mrs. Murray's disclaimer and proceeded to bring the service to an end. The third idea is linked to the second, but from a slightly different point of view. Churches, and I speak here not of individual churches in a denomination, but the whole denomination, goes through periods of growth and periods of stagnation or even shrinking. When an organization articulates a new idea or truth, while it may be at odds with society in general, if this is the right time and place for this idea to grow, others will be attracted to the group. It is articulating a new vision, a new way of being, that while possibly threatening to the larger society, is also seen to be the way of the future for many, and the organization may grow and flourish. 
For decades, the organization may be persecuted for its new ideas. But often, the larger society in time adopts the mores and values of the liberal organization. An example of this might be the idea that the Bible is not the only source of religious truth. For a very long time, saying this could have you murdered by the Inquisition. But now it is mainstream thinking. And now this organization that once prided itself on representing a new and bold vision is in danger of being subsumed into the churches and organizations of the wider society. It no longer represents a unique and future vision, and membership can drop. The conflict here is within the larger organization as it seeks to identify and embrace a message that is relevant to the wider community, but is also just more forward-thinking. An example of this is when the Unitarian Universalist Association chose to confront the manifestation of sexism within itself in 1977. In the 1960s and early 1970s, numbers were dropping drastically in the UU denomination. In 1977, the General Assembly of the UUA adopted a resolution on women and religion calling upon members of the UUA to examine their own religious beliefs and the extent to which these beliefs influence sex role stereotypes, both within families and within the religious movement itself, to avoid sexist assumptions and sexist language in the future. One of the results of the Women and Religion Resolution was the development of the Seven Principles. The Women's Federation proposed new language to the principles, and after an extensive denominational-wide process, a consensus emerged. But also during this process, the organization became stronger. It became a recognized advocate for women's justice, and the numbers started to increase again. But as these ideas and practices became mainstream in society, the organization no longer had that unique voice that reflected a forward vision, and again, attendance dropped. So to summarize this far, we know that ideas evolve, that the behavior of whole societies evolves, in part thanks to the tensions and conflicts which we have looked at. But why do people and groups risk everything for an idea? What can be so important as to merit being burned at the stake for it? Are these people mad, grandiose, victims of their own self-importance? Could it be that they are driven by the desire to uncover deeper religious truths, truths that were being masked by the static structures of power that organized religion had evolved into? If we can let this question hang in the air for a moment, I think the answer deserves a two-part exploration. First, what is the root and nature of mainstream churches? And secondly, what is the root and nature of Unitarian Universalism? Throughout the world, there have been several great prophets who proclaimed a vision which was able to be received and acted on during a particular time and place in history. Muhammad, Buddha, Abraham, Jesus, and many more, who have somehow carried with them the experience of the sacred to such an extent that when people were around them, they also experienced extraordinary sacred energy. But, the teacher is not the destination. The teacher has always pointed to a source and a way beyond him or herself. And eventually, being mortal, the teacher dies. And the disciples, desperate to hold on to the experience of being with that teacher, writes the words he said codifies and locks down anything that might be a way back to the experience of being with the teacher. 
true to human nature, we start to create rules, dogmas, and then threats, and eventually the path of light becomes a path of grasping at power and control. Perhaps along the way, Calvin touched something of the sacred, but his temperament and his culture required conditions for acceptance, punishments for those who did not conform. He was human. He couldn't conceive of this any other way. Ostracization from humans, even ostracization from God, was threatened and tragically has been believed over the centuries. Unitarianism did not evolve like this. It did not have a single teacher who led the way, no. It was formed by thousands of people who listened to the small God of their inner truth, their conscience, and they spoke out against the man-made restrictions on free speech, free thought, even when to do so was punishable by death. Could it be that love allows for freedom of thought? They fought for democratic process when the Protestant or Catholic Church took all control from the hands of the congregations. Could it be that love allows for responsible freedom of action? They questioned the idea that the Bible is a closed and finite source of God's revelation. They said, no, listen to nature. Pursue the discipline of science. Be in awe of this world and see that of God in it. Could it be that love is being revealed in every moment and every one? They spoke out for justice for all people, people of color, people with a fluid sense of their sexuality, people who are vulnerable. Could it be that love is alive in the actions of those who fight for the rights of others? I have worked amongst you for 20 years now, and I can attest that Unitarian Universalists do not only react against the restrictions of traditional religion, they also fully embrace and live a life that is physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual. On a Sunday morning here, there are no conditions required to experiencing the sacred. And sacred love is present here. When the arc of compassion spins between people who glance into each other's eyes with hope and vulnerability, sacred love is here. There are no texts that must be read. There are no creeds that must be believed. There are no prayers that must be said. We are all included in this mystery that is life. Unitarian Universalists embrace the reality that the sacred can be experienced in very different ways for different people. For some, it is in deep meditation a feeling of oneness with the universe. For others, it could be rocking a baby, raising a family, life being messy and hard. For others, delving deep into science and math, reverence and awe at the mysteries of the universe. We do not have to experience the wonder of this life in the same way to be a united and sacred organization that supports experiencing sacred energy in ourselves, in each other, and in the world. Is there anything we must do to be a religious organization? Well, yes. As an official church organization, there are all sorts of societal rules. But in terms of walking a sacred path 
as individuals and as a church, I believe that I, you and we are doing just what is exactly perfect right now. I think it is easier though if we are fully immersed in now. If you dig deep into what your life is for right now and do that. And if your way involves the conflict of calling out truth to others who do not want to hear, let us listen with minds that are open and hearts that are kind. So to summarize, Unitarian Universalism has been formed over centuries by brave people who listen to their voice of conscience in an attempt to cut through the trappings of power and authority in the church to shine light on the actual natural message of religion. A message which for centuries was all but lost in the dreadful rigidity of organized religion. The message I believe, is that everyone is loved and is worthy of love. And I'm not talking about Hollywood romantic love here. I'm talking about the deepest embrace of care and knowing that we can even imagine. It is that you have endless creative potential. It is that we and our earth are all interconnected in this extraordinary web that is love. I believe that the condition of being love and grace-filled has no need to be affiliated with any religion. Let me say that again. I believe that the condition of being love and grace-filled has no need to be affiliated with any religion. It stands alone. You are loved, and you are love. You, each one of you, are truly beacons of light. Take your laughter, take your joy, take your vulnerability and your gratitude into the world and make a difference. Amen. We're going to join together now, singing, We Are Answering the Call of Love. Thank you.
So I'm going to do something a bit different for our candles of joys and concerns today. I'm going to ask you who you would like held in love, in joy, or in sorrow, or they just need some energy. So if you feel comfortable, could you suggest a name and maybe something of it, and I'm going to write it down, and then I will incorporate it into our moment of meditation. Anybody? Lynn Webster. Lynn Webster. And the issue is? Pardon? And what's the issue? Um, oh. Medical. Medical. Absolutely. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Devon. Webster, absolutely. Anyone else? Yes. Sorry? Marilyn Lease. I remember Marilyn Lease. Yes. June Han. June Han. Yes. Okay. Oh, yes, of course. Nancy McMaster. Anyone else? Yes. Family of Vivian Silver. Could you say that again, Ruth? Vivian Himboldt. Lovely. Yes. Of course. Penny Atkinson. Anyone else? David O'Hanlon. Yes. Yes. Cheryl's aunt and Annette. Anyone over here? Yes. Karen. Yes. Led better. Yes. Out of surgery. Anyone else? Yes. Diana. Liliana. Diana's sister. Liliana. Anyone else? We have a powerful room here. Yes. Gisela. Inga and Christine. Yes. Anyone else? Yeah. Joseph. Joseph. Yes. Okay. My sister Lisa. Lisa. All right. Anyone last? That I'm not seeing. Yes. My son Dominic. Dominic. Absolutely. Have I missed anyone? Ah, Brian. Alexa. All right. Okay. Okay, here we go. We are vibrating with energy. Can you feel it? Well, I know I am. I had too much coffee this morning. <laughs> Let's use this energy for this sacred ritual of cares and concerns. I know there are many in the room who hold loved ones or themselves in extra tender care. <sighs> Spirit of love, we thank you for your presence within and amongst us today. We see in our mind's eye beautiful, radiant, warm light. We see this light around each one of us circling clockwise, around us and through us. Our spirits rest in this light, in this place of being. And we draw into focus this light. We see it around ourselves. And we see it around those we love. We hold in this light Lynn Webster. And 
Devon Webster. We hold Marilyn Lees in healing light. June Han, may she have strength. We see Nancy McMaster radiant. And the family of Vivian Silver. May they experience some peace in turbulent times. Vivian Himbo. We see Penny Aitken. And David O'Hanlon. May he know peace and calm and strength. We hold Cheryl in light. We hold Karen Ledbecker. Diana's sister, Liliana. May she experience light and healing. We hold Inga and Christine. Our hearts are with Joseph. May he come through this time with clarity, knowing himself to be absolutely fine. We think of Lisa. We think of Dominic. May he be held in love and know himself to be absolutely perfect. And we think of Alexa, radiating light and love. We hold each one of these people, each one of you, in love, utterly connected to each other and utterly connected to all that is. Amen. Please, uh, they will take the offering as I invite all of you into the spiritual practice of generosity. Each month, 100% of our offering plate collections this morning, unless you've noted otherwise on your contribution, is given to a nonprofit organization whose mission we value. And our outreach recipient this month is Food Stash. Food Stash collects over 100,000 pounds of food per month that would otherwise go to waste, and they deliver it every week to charitable partners and households. Mr. and beauty, 
gratitude for your heartfelt generosity and what it does to help others beyond this community, we give thanks. And we have a few announcements today. Don't forget to go for coffee downstairs. If you're new or newish to Unitarianism, you might want to sit at the table with the white tablecloth and join um, Liz Moffat and Leslie Gibbons for a chat about what we do here in this community. And then if you, after you grab your coffee, for those of you who might be interested, please come upstairs to join Marcia Stevenson, who's going to um, show a, a small film about the Food Stash Organization. It's a short film, and you can enjoy some home-baked goodies with Marcia from Marcia's own stash, and um, watch the video about the food operation. It's very interesting, so I advise it. It won't be, won't be long. And then um, our annual pledge campaign is just finishing up. It, it really helps with our church planning if you're able to indicate what you hope to give toward our operating budget for next year. You can do it either online or on paper, but either way it's really important that you fill out the form that's attached because it really helps Jannie with her bookkeeping and it saves her a lot of time trying to track down how you in, what your intentions are. And the foyer, uh, on the foyer table, there are the paper forms. And then Allison has a couple of announcements. Yes. Thanks, Sue. Um, so, yeah, there's two things coming up over this next week. Uh, the first is we have a Kaylee, another Kaylee. If you would like to laugh, be in the company of each other, children, seniors, middle age, doesn't matter where you are, you can sit down on a seat and just watch others, or you can kick up your heels and enjoy a Kaylee. It is next Saturday, November the 25th, from 4.30 to 6 p.m., so you don't even have to drive in the dark. Well, maybe just getting dark when you're going home. A lot of fun. Our wonderful Bob Rents is calling the dances, so if you don't know how to dance, that's just fine. He's great. 
The other thing is next Sunday on November 26th after church, there will be sandwiches and then I invite you to bring them up here and we're doing a social justice workshop. When the board started uh, last June or maybe at the beginning of this year, they decided it would be, I don't know what the word is, wise, to pick one environmental mission or cause and one social justice cause. Um, several folks, Barb Kroon, Marsha, probably several, of, uh, several others are holding the environmental piece. Elaine Duval is holding from the board the social justice piece. And I felt this is so important that I kind of, I, I said, okay, I took my life into my hands. I said, I'm gonna try and make this thing happen. So um, the purpose of the workshop after church next week will be to encourage us as a congregation to choose one cause that the, this congregation will work towards hand in hand with the environmental piece. They need to work with each other to give legs to the mission of this congregation. So we will now close our, almost close our service with the hymn, Love Calls Us On. Oh, one, one Sue has another announcement. Sorry, Sue. You'll want to be at church next week. Bruce Grierson was going to lead our, a service on following. And he's going to try to persuade you that following is the new leading. <laughs> and, and he's going to do that in a followy, not a leadery way. And, um, and he says, coffee will follow that service unless it leads. <laughs> so you'll have to come find out. And now we'll sing Life Calls Us On.
taking our chalice into our hearts with the words, we extinguish this flame. And carry with us the light of the vision and the warmth of hope. The world calls us to live with depth, meaning, and purpose. We go forth with courage and love. can I tell you how deeply you radiate love? Each of you barrage each other with love. I feel it. It is all around me. It is all around each of you. It is around those who you will meet today. It is around those who you care for. Those who you live with even those who drive you crazy. <laughs> it is right there between you all. You are loved and you are love. Go out into the world and share that truth. Peace be with us all. Let us join hands or arms or elbows, especially with those who have masks and um, let us go singing Circle Round for Freedom. Circle Round for Freedom 